My name is Jennifer Apgar. I'm the Education Director here at Peters Valley School of Craft, and I'm excited to welcome you to our ninth session, I believe, of our instructor presentations. Um, it's definitely been a highlight of my summer, and I hope that it is for all of you, too. Um, I'm just so thankful and grateful to our artist instructors. Um, they've been so generous in, in sharing their work and inspiration with us each week. Um, it's great to know that we're still connected, even though we can't be together here on campus, um, and we're actually reaching more people and, and getting out there, which has just been phenomenal. I do have a program note. Uh, Bruce Daner was going to present um, tonight about the Anagama. He has asked to be postponed to next week. So please stop back again on um, next Friday at 7 p.m. and he will do the presentation then. But tonight I'm joined by five of our amazing talented instructors um, and I can't wait to see their work. And um, so I guess let's just get started. Uh, first presenter for the evening is going to be Lori Klein. Lori is recognized worldwide for her infrared photography. She began as a biomedical photographer in undergraduate school where she used infrared film for research and diagnostic purposes. What solidified her love and passion for infrared was when she began photographing with infrared film under the tutelage of Ansel Adams. She was just a young woman and she has never looked back. Lori gained acclaim and recognition as an infrared portrait photographer photographing the female form in the environment. She has been teaching for more than 30 years and her work has appeared in hundreds of publications and numerous gallery exhibitions. She is the author of two infrared photography books, Photographing the Female Form with Digital Infrared and Infrared Photography and Artistic Techniques for Brilliant Images, which is co-authored with her son, Kyle Klein. She also authored Hand Coloring, coloring Black and White Photography. Um, Lori and her son, Dr. Bryce Perler, teach expressive arts for transformation and wellness. And I understand that you did also author another book that I don't have on my list, Lori. So if you want to tell everybody what that is. Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> it's another infrared <laughs> book. Updated with Shelly Vandegrift. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Lori. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's so good to be here. Um, it's so good to see faces that people I love. And um, anyway, so I'm going to get started. And it always takes me one second to get my slideshow going. Um, so I, um, I've been teaching at Peters Valley, I think it's been over 10 years. Um, um, some of my students are on, Gary's on, I'm not sure who else, and um, Nicole Kodzilla is with me, and um, she's uh, my model almost every year and um, helps me out with workshops. So in, um, we found that uh, Peters Valley is so magical. It's so magical for photographs um, and photographic processes. And, um, you know, so we do a lot, I do a lot of the female form as our model in the Peters Valley landscape. So I'm gonna start with that and then I'm gonna go to the joy of self-expression using your smartphone, which is the next workshop that I will be offering because I obviously cannot be in person there. And it's kind of hard to get photographs like this um, from afar. So anyway, Nicole and I have been, um, you know, it's a wonderful pair. Um, I know a lot of you are creatives, artists, having muses are just such amazing things. And she and I have worked together since she was 16. Um, so it's been a long, incredible experience. So one of the times we have a really great repeat, a lot of our students come back every single year, which is really exciting. So each year it's like, okay, we've got to go someplace new, we have to do something new. So this one was a few years ago, this photograph, and we were photographing in the river, we always photograph at this place. And um, we kind of looked at Justin and said, wouldn't it be cool if we could photograph horses here? Now we had ever, never in all the 10 years seen a horse come down the, um, the river. And don't you know, sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for because it happens. Here comes two riders out of the blue on their horses, stood and posed to us and then said, oh, would, you know, and pointed to Nicole and said, would you like to get on the horse? Now she hasn't been on a horse before and it sure looks like she has. So, and then the greatest thing was, was just when I was going to take the photograph because I was doing a demo for the students is that he pulled up one of his legs like he was talking to us. So I do think that Peters Valley is one of the most magical places um, in the world. Um, one of the first classes that we taught um, was Bodies and Water and it was during a drought and it's like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? It was in August, where are we gonna find water that's safe to put Nicole and our other models in? And so um, I found a puddle 
She's in a puddle, the poor girl is in a puddle. But what we had is we had silver and gold leafing and we put it on her face. And the way she was holding her, her face almost looks like a mask and it's so tender. So sometimes we have to improvise and we're given what we're given. And sometimes we're, you know, uh, the, the landscape is so gorgeous that we could lose ourselves in just making pretty pictures. So now it became different kinds of stories. Um, I'm an ambassador for uh, Lens Baby, which is um, a lens system that does kind of these funky things. And I really love this image because this is Nicole. It's like she's coming out of the water, but the whole water be around it, it has like a vignetting and a, um, you know, a distortion around the edges to give it a lot of movement. And then just having her come up. So only part of the image is in focus. But again, when we have students that are coming back every year, we need to go deeper. We need to tell different stories. This was one of the first years we ever taught there. Um, and uh, I love this model. I love this person. Um, and what happened was is that we, we just, we saw this landscape and the river by itself would have been gorgeous, but we wanted to add something to it, which in this case was um, a human figure, um, a female form. And so what I did is I had her sit there, she was wearing a cape, had her drop the cape, and then I had her, she's a yoga teacher. So I wanted her to, you know, you learn what your models are good at and what they love to do. Like Nicole's a dancer, as you could tell, the way she moves her body. So what I did is I had her we had to do this numerous times to pull water up to get scoops full of water and then just let it drop so that it would have like these three ripples so it would repeat the bodice you know her backside her derriere and so it just has you know this incredible feeling and interpretation that anyone could have um, we don't need much. There's lots of beautiful fields around the area. We don't need much. It's just, it's what are we trying to say? What do we feel? And then we just, we do role playing and storytelling. So many of you know Ellen Durkin and, Durkin, and she is the Iron, Ma Iron Maiden Forge. And so one year she asked if we would like to use some of her props and some of her clothing that she's made it made. And this is one of our models, Brie, and this is down at the river. And it was like this, you know, trees, these roots, it looked like a throne. And so we put Brie in this. Now it's like a hundred degrees out and she's wearing this metal on her body. So um, we had to take a picture really quick, but it was, you know, we had her make look like a queen. And so this is a photograph. We were walking up one of the mountains one day and I just saw these, this, you know, these um, ferns that had light on them. So sometimes it's the simple is really the best. Um, storytelling, um, a lot of the buildings, you, a lot of you know the history of what's happened in the Delaware Water Gap and this building, this, you know, this wonderful structure was down and there was this, oh, um, you know, a door that had a cross on it and I liked the model. She kind of looked like me when I was younger. So I told a story through that. So we have a lot of elements of going inside as well as outside because the buildings inside has a lot of feeling to it. There's texture and there's decay and there's still beauty. So I think a lot of what we do is we do role playing, we do method acting. So we get into the feelings. What are the feelings that you're having? What are the feelings? How do we tap into the people that used to live in the Delaware Water Gap? So what I'm doing is I'm doing, um, because our class obviously was postponed to next year, like all of them have been. So I'm doing the joy of self-expression using your smartphone because everybody's got a smartphone and it will be October 24th and 25th. And so sometimes, oh, because the phone is always with us. And I also find that I take different types of photographs. I don't usually do carrots in infrared or do it for hand coloring or in my other images. So I take other types of photographs photographs with them. You know, a mannequin, not really something that I would do with my infrared. So it gives me a different voice. And so one of the things that's happened now with COVID is I, you know, I had to reinvent myself all of my workshops and I would, you know, Gary was coming with Nicole and me to Sedona. We were going all over the world this year. And so what we had to do is go inside and I didn't want to do infrared anymore because infrared is pretty. So I had to adopt my, adapt my, um, 
my well, my systems of what I was working with, like the infrared camera, into my iPhone or into this you know this trio lens that I use from Lens Baby because it's this is veil and we don't know what's real. I don't know what's real anymore. And then what I started to do was take images from Peter's Valley. Like this is one of our models um, and co and coordinators that helped us one year. And I took that photograph and I put it into a landscape. And so these are composites. And one of the really wonderful things is that we can composite very easily in um, with our iPhones. And that's what a lot of what we'll be doing in the class that I'm teaching. And you can see Bree's face. This is the one that was wearing the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, that was on the throne um, a little while ago. Um, this is Nicole. I photographed her. We were doing a shoot in Peters Valley and she was on a road. She was just laying on the road sucking on a, um, on a lollipop and I took the picture and I never knew what I was going to do with it and then during COVID it was just like oh my god I can't fly anymore that's the Great Lakes um, and you know the scale is way off because things are so way off so I started using those as my metaphors we're finding and this had dust on it I didn't clean the dust off because it told a different story so it's a photograph within a photograph and I'm finding that people that are creative they're having an easier time right now you know managing through COVID, managing through all that we're going through because they have a way to express themselves. And one of the great things about working with my son is because he is a doctor, he knows they, they have, they have testing that they can see how people that can express themselves and, um, you know, make art, how it totally changes them. There are days that I am just really like bummed out and depressed and I'm sure we all can feel this. And so I'll just, I'll say, I don't even care what I'm photographing. I'm taking my iPhone out and I'm just gonna take pictures because I don't know what else to do with myself. So that's one, I think this is gonna be a really good class in October because we're still gonna be with COVID. So how do we take our expression and how do we try something that we've never done before, whether it's through composites, self-portraits, or or whatever. And um, I know I'm going to speak from, for Nicole and me, we really miss being at Peter's Valley and um, the Friday nights, but this was so wonderful that you invited me to come and talk tonight, Jen, and I have 30 seconds left. Yes, you so, do. You did yeah. amazing. <laughs> I know. This was like speed dating. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. It's great to see your new work. It's really interesting. Oh, thank you. For thank sharing. You. It's exciting. Thanks. Our next presenter is Anna Koplik. Anna attended Pratt Institute for BFA in Jewelry and has worked at Peters Valley, Atlas Forge, Touchstone Center for Crafts, Spirit Ironworks, and the Center for Metal Arts. She has also taught blacksmithing at a variety of craft schools. She is currently working as a journeyman blacksmith and fabricator at Davis Metal Smiths in Texas. Anna has a passion for educating and showing beginner smiths the many different possibilities blacksmithing has to offer. Her personal work focuses mainly on tool and utensil making and combining functionality with a refined, delicate aesthetic. Hi, Anna. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I am a journeyman blacksmith, and I want to just tell a little bit of my history and how I got into what I'm doing and where I'm at now. So uh, these are two pictures of me when I was little. Uh, as you can see, I always loved wearing pretty dresses and getting dressed up and you know, bright colors. And I've also always really liked weapons. Um, and uh, then here we have me now. Um, I still really like bright colors and getting dressed up and feeling all fancy. And I also travel with everything I own and all of my tools in the back of my truck and jump from blacksmith job to blacksmith job. Uh, so how did that all start? Well, I, uh, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn to get my BFA in jewelry. And while I was there, I was you know doing metal smithing, making bracelets, uh, doing other metal forming. Um, and I ended up taking a welding and forging workshop uh, one semester when I was in college. And as my final project decided I was going to forge a sword. Um, and that was my first time ever doing any type of forging, any type of blacksmithing, and I fell in love with it. Um, I made what I would now call a sword shaped object, uh, but I had discovered something I really loved. 
Um, but I was still in school doing jewelry work. I was trying to find ways to incorporate my newfound interest in forging, my never ending interest in weaponry, all into the jewelry work that I was currently doing. Um, and then over the summer in between years of school, I went to Pierce Valley for the first time. And I went as a student and took a couple bladesmithing workshops and got introduced to the whole process of bladesmithing and the whole world of blacksmithing and forging more than I had ever even imagined. Um, and then I went back to school. I did my senior thesis where I focused on, uh, I focused on wearable weaponry and this idea of maintaining control over my own body by having these objects that fit to my body perfectly and were made for me but if anyone else tried to come near me, they would be injured by these sharp blades I had attached to myself. Once I graduated, I went back to Peters Valley and was the assistant there for a summer. Um, and I made a bunch of weapons. Um, but I also got to be introduced to everything else that the blacksmithing world has. And I started to make tongs, to make hammers, utensils and all of this other side of blacksmithing outside of just weaponry. I did get to take a sword making workshop and sort of complete my childhood obsession with swords. Um, and then from there, I was able to start focusing more on the blacksmithing side of things. I went home for a little while, had no idea what I was doing, just knew I wanted to be forging. And then I got a, um, blacksmithing technician position, managing the blacksmith shop at a craft school in Pennsylvania, Touchstone Center for Crafts. Um, while I was there, I started making you know, more tools and utensils, trying to figure out what my voice was and what my interests were within the blacksmithing world. Uh, I got a job um, during that time, also uh, apprenticing with a local blacksmith at Playful at Atlas Forge. And that was my first exposure to more architectural blacksmithing, doing scroll work, fabrication, making railings, things for the home, more of the job side of this world. Um, and after that, I was able to go get my next more production blacksmithing job working at Spirit Ironworks on Long Island. Um, and there I was making you know, piles of scroll work and, you know, hundreds of feet worth of railing and welding all these things together. And, I was getting to build balconies and pergolas and do all of the layout, installation, measurements, all of this other side of the metalworking and blacksmithing world that when I had first started, I never even knew existed. Uh, and this became more of how I figured out to make a living uh, doing blacksmithing in the way I wanted to be. From there, I went back to Touchstone. I did a residency and sort of went back to that tool making that I realized that I had a uh, love for and got to focus in my residency on tong making specifically and tools in general and realize how obsessed I was with this functional process and making these objects. I also started making these sort of delicate, refined, useless utensils, I like to call them, um, and trying to figure out how my voice and my aesthetic fit into the whole blacksmithing world. And I was finding it was this really tiny, delicate forging that I was drawn to. Um, I bounced back to Long Island for a bit, did more architectural work, was realizing that, you know, I could find a way to do both the jobs of architectural work and then use that as a way to do the fun, small forgings I love to do as well. Uh, after being back at Long Island, I ended up doing a six month internship out at Center for Metal Arts, a relatively new blacksmithing school uh, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I was working for these two guys, Pat and Dan. Um, and I got to work at the school, which is located in the historic uh, blacksmith shop of the Cambria Iron Company Bethlehem Steel facility in Johnstown. And I got to work um, with these historic power hammers, specifically the one on the left in this picture, uh, that we got back up and running during my time there. 
Uh, I got the opportunity to work under this power hammer. It's a 3,000 pound, uh, originally steam powered power hammer that um, very few artist blacksmiths have the opportunity to work under. And I got to work in a scale and with processes that are just, you know, once in a lifetime experience. Uh, I was also doing more production tong making was there, getting to reproduce the same object over and over again and refine my tong making skills. I was making um, more complex tools, more moving parts, working to refine my forging as I was learning from uh, my bosses at the time. And I was playing around again with tool making and refined small forgings and started focusing on scissor handles as like just an interesting forged element to deal with. And I, for the first time, was trying to incorporate the idea of the forging of a tool as a des design element rather than as a functional element, um, which is something I'm still trying to figure out how to fit into my work, but it really inspires me. Um, after leaving Center for Metal Arts, I traveled around. I was teaching, um, bouncing from craft school to craft school. I went back to Peters Valley and taught a tool making class. That's Peters Valley's blacksmith shop on the left. Um, I went and visited various old jobs, old bosses, got to do some fun forging, more architectural work, more large scale work. And then I packed up everything I owned. Um, and I drove down to Austin, Texas for the Austin Forging Competition. Um, I, it was a weekend event and I had no plans beyond that weekend in my life, basically. And I was back in March. I was there watching eight teams of blacksmiths compete. Got to meet blacksmiths from around the country, support some amazing blacksmithing friends. And by the end of the weekend, I had found a job and a pandemic had hit. Uh, so I ended up out in rural Texas, outside of Austin, uh, working at Davis Metalsmiths. Um, I live here and work here now. Um, the job that I'm here working on is a very large uh, set of bronze railings, mostly fabrication work. So it's all uh, a lot of welded components um, and very intricate finishing work, which you know, I can go back to my jewelry skills from the very beginning as uh, something to rely on to do the finishing work in this job. Um, and so I'm out here with other journeyman uh, metal workers and we're making railings during the day and all living and hanging out together. And the evenings we get to play around and forge and I'm still forging tools and exploring as much different types of tool making as I can while also just like having the space and time to play and make weird metal objects uh, like bronze tacos and weird little funky handheld metal things. Uh, so that's where I am right now. And uh, I don't really know where I'm gonna go next. I don't know what I'm gonna do next, but um, I'm gonna keep going new places, learning new things, making more metal stuff and having some cool adventures along the way. So yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, and back over to you, Jen. Thank you so much. It's been so exciting watching your journey from being an assistant until uh, what you're doing now. So we appreciate you joining us. Our next presenter is going to be Keith Tompkins. Keith is an inventor, a motorcyclist, an accomplished woodworker, and most of all, a wood turner. His turning career has taken him as far away as Hawaii and New Zealand and across most of the US. Keith's goal as a turner is to make his work uniquely his, based on his own tastes, imagination, and life experiences. His work has been sold worldwide and has been showcased in over 50 publications. He approaches his teaching in the same manner. His goal is to help students become better turners. He believes improvements in students' work can be immediate. It does not have to take years of trial and error methods. Keith enjoys showing how even the smallest detail, change, or design element can make a huge improvement in the student's work. Welcome, Keith. Good to see you. Hi, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start uh, showing some of my work and share some of my background. Uh, my first experience in woodworking was in high school. 
I took a wood shop class and I got introduced to wood turning at that point. Um, after high school, I worked immediately in the cabinet making shop. I spent nine years there. And so that kind of uh, really got my interest in woodworking. I did a lot of production work. I invented uh, some processes in making chairs. And when I started in this shop, we made about maybe 10 chairs a week. When I got done, we were doing 300 a day. So um, we became a, basically a national supplier of furniture. So I've got a pretty extensive background in, in building chairs. But the thing that really caught my imagination was turning on the lathe. Um, so I'll start with what I got on the screen. I call this one cherry bomb, a piece of maple. It's turned and hollowed and the finial is turned and carved. A lot of my pieces, this one I call the barangue after the dance. Um, my brother gave me a big mahogany bed post and he said, see what you can make out of this. And that's what I came up with. And to me, it looked like two dancers together as one. And I named it merengue. Uh, the interesting thing is I can't dance at all. So where I get this idea of dancing from, I don't know. But uh, I like to take an idea and expand upon it and see how far I can take that idea. And I like to do something from my own imagination. So instead of borrowing from what I see, I try to do something that's truly mine. And this, this piece here is two different turnings that have been combined into one and then turned on several different axis points to come up with this. This one got a niche award in Philadelphia, I think around 2005. I noticed a lot of my work shows a sense of motion. And I figured out if my work shows any kind of motion, I can't lose. And so you can see that sense in almost every piece I make, either it looks like it's going to explode or it's got a sense of lift, or it looks like it's moving even when it's sitting still. This is a piece of big leaf maple that I gilded with gold. And the inspiration behind this piece, I was teaching a class in turning bowls. And someone said to me, well, you're a recognized artist, you have a certain style. How could I come up with my own style? So I went to the chalkboard and I drew something like this. And it sat there for most of the day. And I looked at it and I looked at it, you know, and I said, I'm going to steal my own idea. And I went home and I made this thing. So sometimes it comes from nowhere, just pops into your head. This is another dance piece I call Tango. And I was at the Philadelphia Furniture Show having dinner after the show and this piece popped in my head and I wrote it down on a napkin. And I kind of came to me at the same time how to make it and what I wanted it to look like. So. I learned to keep a sketchbook with me. If I get an idea, I'll write it down, make a quick sketch, and then go back and make it before the idea escapes me. Um, this one, again, you can see the sense of motion. This was a piece of Bradford pear off a tree where a, a branch broke off. So I hollowed it. I cut it down to the side. I made a slit in it. And then I steam bent it. So it gives me that sense of unfurling. And I use that same leaf steam, the sense of leaves open and unfurl. And so the whole piece again, you can see a sense of motion, even when it's sitting still. And some of these pieces, um, this is actually the first one I did where I steam bent it. And again, the Bradford pear, I turned it, I cut it. I steamed it, and then I wanted to decorate it a little bit. So I used metal leaf on the inside, painted the outside, and, and textured the rim. So it gives it a whole different effect. Um, 
I hadn't seen too many people do this type of seam bending where you, you cut it apart and uh, bend it. And so that's something I'm still pursuing, seam bending turnings in different ways. This piece is holly, ebony, and a cherry burl. And the interesting thing about this one is completely turned on the lathe. And this is the first time I made a spiral shape. And the cube is actually turned on the lathe on three axis points. So I like to experiment on a lathe, coming up with different ideas, turning on different axis points. The rows on the top is actually three turnings combined. So it's different radiuses combined. And it's got to be precise or include exactly, or it won't look correct. I like to talk about, in my classes, life experiences. And I was a fisherman as a kid. And when my grandson was born, I went to my lathe and I started turning some fishing lures. I figured I'd give him a gift at this a family heirloom. So as I was turning these things, I was doing them one after the other, they appear to be chasing each other. So I thought if I made them in a circle, I, I, this is what I came up with. And I was, as I was working on it, I was actually laughing. I thought it was pretty humorous. And so now there's turning, carving, and some airbrush work. Um, and this is one of those pieces that basically comes out of my own head, which I was very happy with that. Um, I've made several of these, and they've been sold pretty much worldwide at this point. Here's another turning based on spiral form. And I had this idea in my head, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I knew I could turn some of my forms, like the dance pieces, they were straight edges, easy to turn and go back together. But this is a whole different approach to turning. Uh, it looks impossible, especially if you look close to walls paper from thick to thin. And so that is something that I came up with and, and something that I'm working on right now um, to see how far I can take this idea. Um, another form that at first looks impossible to, to turn, how do you turn something and then hollow it out? But once you see how it's done, it's actually pretty simple. So I've done a few of my pieces with thorns glued on. So these are rose thorns and um, basically painted black and painted red on the inside. Um, it looks dangerous. And I didn't have to say to people, please don't touch. I think they got the message when it was at a show. This was a leftover piece from another turning I did, and I call it a self-portrait. I'm kind of crazy. I'm burning my candle at both ends. And um, that's where that came from. This piece is turned from holly. And I turned it off center to give myself a heavy side and a thin side. And by turning it off center, that heavy side allowed me to carve. So I like to combine carving and turning um, in the same piece. I've done quite a bit of carving and my passion is turning. So it's a perfect blend of two different skills. Again, I'm following up on that spiral. I can see a spiral opening up and if I can see that shape, I, I know I have a successful piece. This one is spiraled all the way through and comes out the other side. I had a another turner ask me to critique his bottle stoppers. And uh, I was kind of taken for a minute. So how do you critique a bottle stopper? It's, it's a bottle stopper. But it got me thinking, could I turn signature bottle stopper? Could I put a little bit of myself 
my sense of humor, my funny way of looking at the world into even a bottle stopper. And so that's what I did here. And unfortunately, I got known as the bottle stopper guy, which was not my intent, but um, these are all one piece, the cork and the glasses and that is all one piece. It's just uh, shellac colored and burnt. So it looks like an imitation cork. And here's another one where I did a little play on words, wine and cheese and mouse and cheese. And so I came up with this bottle stopper. Um, it had to be turned on four axis points in order to turn this thing. It was a lot of effort in order to turn just a bottle stopper, but I had a lot of fun with it. This is basically just the bowl. And I taught a lot of bowl making classes. And I like to focus on the shape of the bowl, how critical it is, the form of the bowl, how it feels in your hands, how it sits on the surface. And, and that's the kind of thing I like to talk about in my bowl turning classes. Another bowl that's sort of a calabash shape. I used a little butterfly that we used to do in the furniture shop on rustic furniture. And so here I applied a little bit of that from 40 years ago to a bowl where it had a defect in it. Another similar ambrosia maple bowl, which I turned a bead on the inside and then I textured and colored it. Here's a box I did at Peter's Valley during one of my box making classes. And I like turning boxes, it's a lot of fun. This one has three feet. And I turned and burnt the edge and then later I colored it black. I turn a lot of ornaments just for fun. They're delicate, thin, the globe is hollowed, the finial itself is ebony, and the globe has been dyed yellow. And here's one I did for my daughter. It's the pink element. It's a buckeye burl with holly finials. For my other daughter, I turned another one. This is a very early turning for me. Um, basically, it's about 480 compound miters on a table saw. And I'll glue back together, cut apart again on the lathe, and form the diamond shapes in the center. And even some of my early turns, I was focusing on the form. I wanted the form to be um, very attractive. And that was my last piece. So I wanted to say thank you very much for having me. And I enjoy all the times I had at Peter's Valley. And I can hardly wait to get back there. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. We have to set dates for next year. We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> next up, we have Maureen Duffy. Maureen is a studio jewelry artist and professor who lives and works in Philadelphia, PA. She's an adjunct jewelry and metalsmithing professor at Tyler School of Art and Architecture, Towson University, and Rowan University. She also was an instructor at Fleischer Art Memorial, one of the oldest art centers in the country, where she has helped build the jewelry program that is only a few years old. Maureen's jewelry practice focuses on both production and one-of-a-kind hand-fabricated sterling silver and gold pieces that are inspired by the urban landscape. Hi, Maureen. Good to see you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Um, one second. My mouse likes to disappear on my screen. So, present. Um, sorry. Share screen. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I was really excited and also disappointed not to be able to teach at uh, Peters Valley this summer. Um, my history with Peters Valley is I, in 2004, seems like forever, well, it was forever ago, I did um, my first artist residency ever at Peters Valley um, when I was still an undergrad in school. Um, so 
I was really excited to, after years of being away, to come back and um, be a part of the craft show, take a class, and then to start teaching at Peters Valley. So um, looking forward to the future. All right, so a little bit, I try not to go too far back. I, I kind of started my PowerPoint. Um, oh yeah, and a little bit about me before I say this. I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the heart of South Philly. Um, I live here in a row home with my three children who are 15, nine, and four. So it's a very active household of also all artists. Um, so I started with grad school. Um, started with this body of work that I, I finished with in 2008, um, and it was called Urban Sovereignty. I, was, I went to grad school in SUNY, at SUNY New Paltz, um, which is in the Catskills. And uh, when I was up there, I think, you know, looking at it, like hindsight, um, I kind of look at this work and, and feel like maybe it was like, it was, it was definitely my interest and in, in things that I was making this like post-apocalyptic um, or trying to uh, glorify the urban landscape and, and use that as my um, influence, my, my uh, images, the things that I found interesting and um, as a little bit of a rebellion of, of nature at the time. Now I love nature and I we could give anything to uh, be in nature and not stuck in the city um, during, you know, a lot of us that are stuck in uh, in the cities and during this pandemic. Um, and it would be nice to escape to uh, the woods for a while. But anyway, at the time, um, I really missed living in the city. I missed city life. I missed uh, just everything that the city provided. So my or my my thing on my senior thesis, my thesis was about um, taking parts of the urban landscape, the urban landscape and um, creating functional, non-functional, but wearable pieces out of it. So here we have a manhole cover. I'm supposed to reflect the Victorian collar and then a king's crown, which is a side, the um, sign pulls a Bell Atlantic telephone booth, a fire hydrant brooch, and these are all hand fabricated and then painted. The side of a mailbox, a broken lock, the side of a telephone pole to the left with the cable cords that come around, another mailbox piece, and then chain link fence, back brooch. So all telling a story and then I set this body of work up in the gallery with uh, 250 concrete blocks that I dragged in. Um, the gallery was not super happy about that, but it did make for a really cool display um, and I didn't scratch the floor. So uh, that was that work. And then, so after grad school, I moved back to Philadelphia and um, kind of the recession hit. And I was like, what do I do with uh, this graduate education? There were no jobs. I did luckily get a teaching position at Moore College at the time. And, um, and then a job that I had working at an office, um, which was painfully boring, but it was a job that I had before I went to grad school, it took me back. And um, so I was kind of teaching a little bit and then just starting to try to set up a studio space and figure out what it was that I wanted to do besides teach um, with this, with this education, with the, with all these skills. Um, and then that around 2009, I mean, 2008, 2009 is when the indie craft market started becoming really big. And um, I kind of used that as like a, maybe a, like a launching pad career wise to start making jewelry. But at the time I had left grad school and even undergrad and I was making all these sculptural pieces and things that were, you know, not, not really functional on like an everyday scale. So making actual functional jewelry was a new a new avenue. It's like I had learned it in school. I knew how to make things out of metal, but to actually know how to make something somebody wants to wear and building a brand and but not steering too far away from your own interest just to sell something um, was I found a little bit challenging at first or very challenging at first. And so it's been it's been a it's it's a process. So um, this is actually a more recent photo. I didn't have any old photo I, that I could dig up on my new computer of me back in 2008, 2009 at craft shows. My display did, definitely did not look this good. It was 
definitely a little bit more thrown together. And I was making some weird art that I left, or weird jewelry pieces that I left out of this presentation. So I kind of skipped to what, what I did find that worked. Um, so I made a lot of different things, did a lot of different craft shows, um, low stake craft shows. And people were like, oh, this is neat. This is cute. And I was like, oh, this is not what I want. And so I started looking at the work that I had already made um, in grad school and was like, how do I turn sculptural pieces into small wearable pieces? And, um, and then also started looking, I always like to take photos. I've always loved to take photos around the city, uh, just things that I found interesting. So I had this whole collection of abandoned bicycle series and I just had like a, one of those artist breakdowns where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I just started printing all these pictures up of these abandoned bicycles. And I put them on the wall in my closet space. I had turned a walk-in closet in our row home into a studio space. And I, the whole back of the wall was just covered in these images. And I, I still didn't know what I was, I was like, I don't know what I want to do with them, but I know I want to do something. And I was looking around at jewelry that was being made at the time. And I kept seeing everything was cute. and um and very flat and I was like it, you know the easiest thing to do when you don't have a lot of tools is to pierce and cut through metal and I was like how can I use this to my advantage but not make something that's just cute and sellable and that's when I came to my abandoned bicycle series or by Bi bicycle carcass series kind of changed the name twice now or a couple times so I was traced took my images uh photographs Got, broke out the tracing paper, the light, um, light table and started tracing and then put my drawings down on metal and started cutting. Oh, oh. Some of these images are so old. I don't know why they're not. Oh, uh, they're, wait, show anyway. Oh no, come back. Nope, it's not gonna let me, sh it's not gonna let me show it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's, so when I, when I made this series, and I did a couple big indie craft shows, both here in New York and Chicago. These were flying off the table. Like I couldn't, I couldn't make them fast enough. And I was like, I was in shock because I just had never, you know, never see, really sold art or had like successful, that much of success at these craft shows. So for that to start happening, I was like, okay, I think I'm on to something. So then I was kind of like, what's next after that? Um, and I just kept like venturing out, taking more photos, trying to see what I was interested in, um, common, common interests. And I had all these broken chain link fence photos, wrought iron fence fences, and there's tons of these in probably most cities. Um, Philly, I felt like it was unique to Philly at the time. And then I go to other cities, I'm like, oh, these are everywhere. Um, so I started taking all these different pictures and then trying to figure out how I could comb combine the two different things. Brixton. Sorry, one child down here singing to himself. All right, uh, and then combining the wrought iron fence and chain link fence together and some of the wrought iron by itself. And then started to look at brick walls and the cracks in buildings and how I could turn those into jewelry pieces. So when I started, seeing all these common themes, I finally felt like I, um, oops, there we go. I started getting a, a rhythm and a flow down with, with being able to create a brand for myself, but that I felt good about, I felt confident about, um, that I felt like represented me. And one of the things like when I finally, when I committed to my making my own jewelry line, I just, one of the things I wanted to do was just to make sure that whatever I was making was something that I felt comfortable and that I wanted to wear and that I, you know, I could only hope that other people would also uh, find aesthetically pleasing and want to wear. And it's, it's a funny thing to like venture into something that you're like, I don't want to convince anybody that they should wear this, but I really hope that people love it as much as me because I like wearing it. So um, during the, during while I was doing the indie craft shows, I was also still trying to keep a, a foot in the gallery doors and uh so I was still doing big gallery shows and it was it's it's hard to keep up with both um it is manageable at some point in some life uh then there's other points when things happen and it's like making the work for both becomes a little bit impossible but this whole series was work that went to the society um of crafts in boston 
and start thinking about what the chain link fence represented and what brick walls, chain link fence, wrought iron, all these things represent it. Am I getting close on time? You're getting close, it's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna rush through because I put a lot of slides, so I'll just kind of fly through. So this was a whole series I did where I was putting precious stones, semi-precious stones and pearls and stuff behind, and then brooch and trying to kind of hit all different um, rings, necklaces, earrings, and then at this point, I started looking into other stones. I kind of want to start looking at more of the natural stones, quartz and those kind of things, a uh, picture of drawings, and then just more images. And then uh, after that one big show, I was like, all right, I need to really focus in on a jewelry line. And that's when I started diving deep into just how I could transform my comment, like the images that I, designs I already had and how I could pull them into different pieces. And so I'll kind of flip through this quick so that the chain link fence hoops. And I'm teaching a productions class this semester at Tyler and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it just to like be able to talk about how I, I, one of the things I left out of all this is that I was a production, I worked as a production jeweler for a little over 10 years for different companies. So some of the, me making my own work and, and pulling it into the production world. I think a lot of that influence came from just being in a production setting and kind of getting in that mindset and being able to make things, make your things that you find interesting and in designs in many different forms to um, actually profit off of it. So there's before a show. And then some things that, I'm currently, I've been taking images of um, probably for years now, but, or it has been years, but I just don't, I still don't know what I want to make from it, but it's all these plants and weeds growing out of the bricks and concrete. So that's kind of where I'm headed next. Oh, the last one did not come up. Oh, there it is. And that's that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey as a, as a jeweler with us. It was very interesting. I always saw your work, but I didn't know the story behind it. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. And next up, we have Dennis Fuge. He is a self-taught wood turner who's been turning for 50 years. Dennis was president of the New Jersey Wood Turners Association and has demonstrated at events up and down the East Coast. He turns a wide variety of items, but his main focus is on deep hollow vessels, platters, and artistic pieces. A lot of his work focuses on what nature has already started and he allows the wood together with its flaws and faults to determine what the finished item will look like. Some of his work will only use wood as a canvas using color, mixed media, and carving. Many of the woods he works with are from the Northeast and are what he calls roadkill or rescue timber. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for that introduction. Can you hear me all right? Yes. So, um, I'm sorry we can't be at Peters Valley this year. I really love it up there, but hopefully 2021 is going to be a better year for us. People always ask me, where do I come from with this strange accent? And I always say I come from planet Earth because my father was British. My mum was Irish, South African. I was born in South Africa. My wife is from Zimbabwe. just want to move this one little thing out the way here. My son was born in South Africa. My daughter was born in Hong Kong. We lived in New Jersey for 17 years, and now I'm a Pennsylvania boy. So I think that qualifies me as being from planet Earth. I've been turning for about 50 years. Similar to Keith, I turned my first item at Pretoria Boys High in South Africa when I was 15 years old at a compulsory uh, woodwork, woodworking class. There's the item that I turned. It was a lamp stand. You can see there's a hole in the bottom of the lamp stand for the electrical cord to go in, and then it goes up the stem. And obviously, you finish it with a light fitting and a, and a lampshade. And you can see I got a princely sum of 39% for it, which I think in America you call a big fat F. But that one item caused me to fall in love with wood turning, and I've been doing it ever since. There are a number of themes that run through my work. The first is classic hollow forms. 
There you can see one made out of bird's eye maple with a natural edge top. Another one I call reverse tear, uh, teardrop. Just got to get this meeting alert out the way. For some reason, it seems to be interfering. And that's got bird's eye maple at the bottom. It, the top is an African blackwood finial and it all screws together. Uh, the male blackwood finial uh, screws into a boxwood um, thread. There you can see a slightly better detail of it. The African blackwood at the top and threaded into the, uh, the boxwood. Here's another piece called an ancient apothecary bottle. It's ambrosia maple on the bottom and an African blackwood finial. Another one called Thai inspiration where you've got uh, black locust at the bottom and the African blackwood finial sort of represented by that Thai inspired finial. Another one called the old inkwell. Now I'm combining different colored woods, uh, bird's eye maple at the bottom, Macassar ebony and holly. Holly is that really, really white wood that's in the, uh, the pen that sort of fits into this inkwell. Contrasted beautifully with the Macassar ebony and the uh, bird's eye maple. There's a maple fan. So it's a maple vessel all hollowed out and it's got a natural edge top to it. There's one made out of a redwood burl called Davy's Dream, also with a natural edge top. The second theme that I have is natural root forms. So now I'm using the root of the tree with the trunk of the tree going through the bottom of the picture. And I'm using the roots as these very nice organic forms at the top. There's one called Lady Chatley's Lover made out of swamp mahogany root. Another one made out of ant infested swamp mahogany. It looks almost antique because of the way the, wor the um, ants have dug holes into the wood and caused it to, to blacken. Another one using a paper birch root ball. Now, once more, the stem of the tree is going into the picture and you're using the root, those beautiful uh, sort of um, burl, burl, burly root forms of the um, paper birch finished off with a um, emboya top. The next theme in my wood is windows into wood. So now I'm looking for a natural void in the wood and I'm finishing the external part of the vase to the same quality as the internal. So it drags the people, person's eye, the consumer's eye from the outside and makes them explore the inside part of the vessel. There's one made out of bird's eye maple. Another one made out of mahogany root pearl. Another one made out of uh, maple. Once more, it's got that bark edge, natural edge void where people's eyes have to go and explore the inside of the piece. Then I trained down at the Aramont School of Art under an artist called Jack Schlenz for a week. And he taught us to take pieces of wood, beautiful burl pieces of wood and blacken them and make our own artistic marks on them. So this one looks like an avocado pear. There's one where I've now created what I call the circle of life on the forest floor with the acorn, the seed pod, the mice, the worm, which crawls up to become a butterfly. Another one in that same theme where I've um, used a lot of metal to, to make it the Tiffany forest floor. So the butterfly is actually made out of uh, copper and the acorns have got copper inclusions and the mushrooms have got silver, silver rods in them. This is part of the series that I would have been teaching at Peters Valley this year. This is my view of Saturn. I believe when we finally get to Saturn, we'll find it's got a wooden center. It's got a pewter ring. It's got eggshell around it in the next ring and then little bits of metal. And you'll find it's got eight moons. So that together with these um, golden retriever platters where I burn the little footprints into the platter and then I have the golden retrievers running all over it. There's another one with a female form with eggshell and spackle. That's a piece of black walnut. There's another one which I call the spiral. It's uh, brass spiral rings going sm from small to bigger to bigger to bigger. And then the void on the right hand side, I jump across with brass rods as well. One of the more practical items that I'd be teaching at Peters Valley is these cheese platters that I make. I cannot make enough of them. 
I make them with three mice and a knife and the ladies just love them. The next theme is multi-level wonders. This is the strangest piece I've ever created. This is my interpretation of what Osama bin Laden's cave complex looked like when we were looking for him in Tora Bora. You can see the little uh, windows and doors at the top of the cave, the umbrella that's got his sonic detector hidden under it, and he's got a weapon of mass destruction hiding in it. There you can see the fins of the rocket, the solar panels that light up the cave and light up the rocket, and there you can see his sonic detector with the cord running up the umbrella. So a fairly dark piece, but that's what was happening in my life at the time I made it. This is a lighter piece now. It's also got multi-levels and it's a little mine. It's made out of maple, African blackwood and Macassar ebony. And it's cute because the little cuckoo pan goes down to the bottom of the mine, picks up tiger's eye and all the kids go home with a piece of tiger's eye and they just love this piece. You can see the little chimney, the pyrography brickwork, the windows, the doors. So lots of detail goes into it. This is one of my latest pieces. It's called the Manhattan Mouse House. It's got 37 mice in it. And the property prices in New York, are, that is so expensive that even the mice have to live in high rises. And you can see each floor has a different type of mouse. At the bottom, you have antler security. So that's made out of deer antler. And then the second level, cedar, olive, bacodi, oak, red heart, and African blackwood right at the top of the condominium. And you can see the little mice sunning themselves at the top. So that's called the Manhattan Mouse House and it caught, caused quite a stir at the AAW Symposium last year. Then I have a series called, or a theme called, How to Say I Love You from a Lathe and I've taught that at Peters Valley in prior years. It's focused on the heart and jewelry holders and ring holders and all sorts of beautiful things. Coupled with that, my, my sister-in-law encouraged me to make a life-size bust of her to hold her jewelry and her earrings and her rings, so I did. That's probably the best one in the series, and you can see the belly button had a little void in it, and I used turquoise stone to fill in that area. And it, the sleeve actually slides out the top of this um, bust, and you can put your $100,000 earrings in it and lock it away. Then I have a series called Really Thin, where I turn ladies' hats. This one's made to fit my wife. There's another one with ribbons and butterflies. There's a man's hat with a feather on the front. My final slide is also of a lampstand, but this one you can see the electrical cord going through the sycamore up into the actual um, lampshade, which is made out of red cedar. It's got an ebony top to it and a little heart carved in the top so when you switch on the light the heart actually shines up onto the ceiling. The collector that bought this from me gave me 99% which I think in America you would call an A and the thought I would just leave you is that mighty oaks from little acorns do grow and Jen I want to thank you for inviting me to present tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Dennis. It was such a pleasure to see you and I can't wait to see you next summer. And I knew we'd see a golden retriever somewhere in your presentation, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us. This concludes um, our virtual instructor presentations for this week, and I hope that you will join us again next Friday at 7 p.m. Um, and be sure to check out all of our virtual programming and online workshops that we'll be running through the fall, winter, and spring until we can all be back together again on campus in 2021. So please take good care and stay healthy and safe.